I'm Jazz Fiamingo from the University of Ottawa. My theme today is five pernicious academic terms that have shaped mainstream feminism. For a while, I've had an idea to do an episode on the hyper Orwellian language of the modern university. You know, the kind of thing, the safe space, which is really a pretty scary conformist space where hate speech is outlawed, except of course, against those heterosexual white men one is permitted to hate and where diversity is celebrated and monitored in a rigidly uniform way through trigger warnings and so on. The whole discussion would be carried out with my trademark laugh out loud wit. Well, maybe not the latter part. Seriously, that was the idea, but it developed in its own direction and I found myself exploring certain key feminist terms that began in academia and have moved out into the wider society with ever greater mainstream acceptance. I will argue that these terms to a large extent are responsible for the specific shape of debate about men and women in our society. And the more I thought about the terms, the more I saw that understanding their origins and their underlying assumptions was an important part of understanding the modern feminist worldview, especially its particular resistance to logical debate. Academia matters uniquely in this context, because much as we'd like to shrug it off as a place where highly intelligent, stupid people engage in mostly trivial pursuits, And I don't disagree with that assessment, sadly, but we know that the university is the key arena of indoctrination of our youth today, who then make careers in journalism, law, politics, business, policing, social work, media, the civil service, and the judiciary, where they carry utopian ideology and the immunity to logic into all the main facets of our society with pernicious effect. I don't know that this process can be stopped anytime soon. The network of these revolutionary agents is very firmly entrenched. But I do think that understanding the origins of some of the terms can help us call out the ideologies, biases, and conceptual errors more effectively. The first term that's going to be the subject of today's video is gender. Recently, I've tried to stop using the term gender, kind of as a political protest, substituting the good old-fashioned word sex as much as possible. But it's hard to remember a time before gender was the standard word used to refer to men or women as a group. The problem with gender is that its current meaning comes loaded with feminist assumptions about sex differences that have had a profound impact on fact-based public discussion about equality. From the time of Simone de Beauvoir's rather unextraordinary but pithy statement that, quote, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman, the tendency within feminism has been to claim ever more dogmatically and in the absence of proof that there is no such thing as femaleness outside of the idea of femaleness. This is a kind of feminist version of Descartes' I think, therefore I am, in this case, patriarchy thinks, therefore woman is. In other words, women's perceived differences from men are entirely the result of social conditioning, and any reference to hardwired sex differences is by definition offensive and sexist. Just last summer, to take one example, Sky News aired a short exchange between anti-feminist provocateur Milo Yiannopoulos and feminist journalist Rennie Edo Lodge over the question of whether male brains are better at chess. And all the feminist journalist could say was that such was sexist thinking. She declared it, quote, biological determinism, stereotypical, and 1950s thinking. She was no match for Milo Logically, who cited Simon Baron Cohen's research into sex differences in male and female brains, but she didn't seem to think she had to be. She simply had to hold to the feminist position. 
The extraordinary thing is that the feminist case has been advanced with marked success by social science professors, psychoanalysts, legal theorists, and even literary scholars with no credible scientific backing at all. When Kate Millett published her landmark work of literary criticism entitled Sexual Politics in 1970, she simply declared her belief without arguing for it in any way that women's nature was, quote, essentially cultural rather than biological. Social conditioning makes women what they are, and social conditioning can be undone. Anthropology professor Gail Rubin, in her 1975 discussion of what she called the sex-slash-gender system, at least acknowledged the, quote, raw material of biological sex, which is shaped to become gender, according to Rubin. But later theorists, including psychoanalyst Nancy Chodorow, with her influential feminist theory of gender-differentiated mothering, or passionate anti-pornographer crusader Catherine McKinnon, with her emphasis on femininity as almost purely an expression of submission to male sexual domination, these later theorists were less and less willing to acknowledge biological sex at all, focusing instead on what they called the social practices that produce a sexed self, basically everything that happens to us in the home and in society at large. So by the time we get to Judith Butler and her 1990 magnum opus, Gender Trouble, that focused on gender as performance, we encounter the argument that the sex-gender distinction is completely unintelligible. That's her word. In other words, that sex does not pre-exist gender and cannot be distinguished from it though I suspect few outside of academia, and actually kind of few inside it, have really waded through Butler's impressively convoluted prose, our social elite have generally accepted, with very few uh, of them having any understanding of biology, that most of gender is not based in biological sex, but is a result of social categories and upbringing. Now, why is this stress on the social construction of gender so major? Well, it's simple, because it means that anything is possible. If you have a utopian theory of what the world should be like, the belief that men and women can be reshaped at will is a very attractive idea. Though many feminists, if really pressed, might admit that we don't know that there isn't a biological basis to sex, even a pretty significant one, they'll usually say that it's useful and productive to move ahead as if there isn't. The theory of gender as a social construct is extremely important to feminists because it means that women need never accept or take responsibility for anything they don't like about women's position in society. In any instance in which women fall short of a standard or fail to perform as well as men, external factors, even amorphous ones, can always be blamed since powerful men have ostensibly been in charge of creating the social conditions under which women's identities have developed. Even body size and strength, the one natural bedrock you would think Uh, you know, that would have to be conceded, even that can be explained with reference to social conditioning. Yeah, feminists will bring up nutritional differences between boys and girls, access to weight training equipment, different levels of social encouragement, and so on. For example, a 2011 chapter by professors Judith Lorber and Patricia Martin called The Socially Constructed Body published in a collection called Illuminating Social Life, that chapter actually argues that the primary difference between women and men's performance in sports is caused entirely by a social preference to see women as weak and slender in contradistinction to men's being perceived as strong and muscular. The authors of this chapter are two well-published, highly decorated professors of sociology and women's studies at American colleges, 
And here's a quotation from the chapter to give you a flavor of their acid-tripping fantasy. Quote, Today, when girls and women are professional and amateur players in all kinds of sports, women and men are not allowed to compete against each other. So actual comparisons of men's and women's and boys' and girls' physical prowess are rarely made. So in other words, the professors argue that our society prevents women and men from competing in sports together because that would show that there is no difference in skill level or strength between women and men. They go on to use an example from one of their students. They claim, one student in one of our introductory sociology classes noted that he and the other boys were glad that they did not have to play against the best athlete in their elementary school, a girl. Sex segregation kept her from playing with the boys and probably from showing them up. They conclude that gender is a mass conspiracy, they don't use that term, to fool everyone, to convince us that women are not actually as strong as men. Just in case we missed it, they repeat the point. Here it is. If members of society are told repeatedly that women's bodily limitations prevent them from doing sports as well as men, they come to believe it, and the belief is reinforced by the media. The result is that even women's championship teams falter and fail. End of the quote. You see, when a woman fails to perform as well as a man, the fault is society's because society didn't believe that female athletes are as strong as male athletes. This is the kind of scholarship that students read as fact in their university classrooms, are tested on, rewarded for parroting back, and from which no dissent is allowed. It is surely a kind of madness. It is social constructionism that authorizes the call for ever greater measures to undo the negative effects of patriarchy. No matter how many times such policies fail, feminists simply claim that more are needed that patriarchal bias is still there preventing women from achieving what they're capable of achieving. Because no rational argument about women's capabilities is ever allowed into the discussion, the madness only increases from year to year. Social constructionism likewise justifies countless public campaigns, social policies and laws aimed at changing men, retooling their behavior to make it more acceptable for a feminist world ever more punitive harassment policies, ever wider definitions of sexual assault, ever more aggressive gender programming workshops at universities, ever more elaborate workplace respect codes and equity hiring policies for offices and boardrooms and shop floors. In cases where men are seen to be suffering or falling behind women, that too is essentially men's fault since they are as they are, not because they evolved that way, not because their nature is at odds with feminist dictates, but because they were made as they are by male culture and can be undone and remade. The theory of gender as a social construction thus offers feminists a blank check for transforming men and women without any parameters. And if it destroys our society in the process, you can bet feminists will find a way to blame the patriarchy for that too. But of course, feminists are vulnerable on the front of biology. Just because they try to taint every reference to sex differences with the charge of biological determinism doesn't mean that those who understand biology shouldn't attack them. Surely this is where feminism is truly vulnerable. And the point is that it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand feminist positions. Vice versa, however, most feminists do not understand biology at all. So let's start attacking feminist positions using evidence-based science. Stay tuned for four more fundamental academic terms that have had a pernicious effect on mainstream discourse.